So throughout the Resident Evil franchise, we followed some of the most iconic characters in the gaming industry. From Leon Kennedy, as he was introduced as the rookie cop of the RPD station in Resident Evil 2. What have we got here? To the battle honed stars member Jill Valentine, as we followed her storyline from RE1 to all the way to Resident Evil 3 Remake. But this time around, we have another staple character, a protagonist we followed for many years, which alongside with this franchise, he too has evolved with times, giving him many renditions or variations for us to follow, which this staple character being none other than Chris Redfield the man who made his debut in the classic Resident Evil in 1996. Chris Redfield. To now, where his latest version has him in Resident Evil Village. Chris? Sorry, Ethan. So in this video, we'll discuss some of his background and character development before RE1 and follow his storyline as we see the many faces of Chris Redfield for this road to Resident Evil Village. Anyways, before we do get started with the video, I just want to say my name's Hey Deva, and I do cover a lot of Resident Evil and other survival horror themed media. So if you guys do enjoy these types of videos, then please feel free to like and subscribe for more videos like these in the future. And also possibly adding me both on Instagram and on Twitter, where you guys can message me there personally at any time. I have a job to do, and I'm gonna see it through. Alright, so let's rewind the tape back from this new rendition of Chris Redfield from Resident Evil Village and make our way back to the 1990s, where the concept design and direction to Chris Redfield's character and background would be born. Because for the newer fans for this franchise, the current version of Chris Redfield is drastically different from his initial design, especially when we compare himself side to side, but also when we have this as his opening debut. No! Don't go! So after watching this, one would assume that his character design would be based off a rough and tough protagonist, with the renowned video developer Hideki Kamiya stating this exact fact. Because as we look at the initial design concept for Chris, they did try to portray him as a rough and tough character, with the final design coming along with this rendition. But of course, due to the hardware capabilities of the time, the real-life character portrayals would serve as his base foundation to his overall look, which would later be revamped and redesigned in Resident Evil Remake, but we'll get into that a little bit later in the video. Anyways, with his concept and background design covered, let's quickly go over his backstory prior to the events in Resident Evil 1 and how this would lead him to become one of the most iconic characters in the gaming industry. So his initial backstory has him being part of the US Air Force, giving him the military combat experience and as a pilot. Also here, he would be acquainted with Barry Byrne, who would later with Chris Redfield become part of the RPD Stars Alpha Team. Also somewhere in his background, it was assumed that he lost both of his parents, leaving him to take care of his younger sister, Claire Redfield. Uh, hello. Which in doing so actually would help her become combat ready in her own right, with the different Resident Evil versions out there giving examples of this. Get down! Not bad. I never thought any of this stuff my brother taught me would work. Stars? A special force issue, huh? It's my brother's. That's why I'm here. To find him. I'm Claire Redfield. Hey. Leon Kennedy. Anyways, like I mentioned earlier, Chris would be part of the Raccoon City Police Department's Stars Alpha Team, 
which was a specialized group of elite individuals who took on some of the more complex missions that the RPD had to offer. And at this time, Chris had proven himself to be highly regarded by his peers due to his excellent marksmanship and combat ability. Even Albert Wesker, the captain of the Stars Alpha team has high regards of Chris's abilities. But even with all this background, Chris would have his life changed on July 1998, the time when Raccoon City would report several grisly murders in the outskirts of his city, prompting the RPD's Bravo team, the other half of Stars, to investigate these occurrences first. Though through some tragic circumstances that occurred during Resident Evil Zero, Star's Bravo team would be decimated, leaving some ravaged by the monsters around the Arkley Forest, while some taking shelter at the Spencer Mansion. This in turn would have the RPD send their Star's Alpha team to investigate Bravo team's whereabouts, finally involving Chris right in the middle of this mysterious event surrounding Bravo team. But it wasn't long after they made touchdown at the Arkley Mountains that they were attacked by some of the monsters nearby. Also, Star's Alpha team pilot Brad Vickers decided to leave the rest of his comrades behind when chaos ensued. No! Don't go! Leaving Chris and the remaining Stars Alpha team members on their own, eventually making their way to the Spencer Mansion estate, where we finally get our first full playthrough of Chris as we discover the mysteries behind all the monsters and the Umbrella Corporation's involvement with all these incidents. There are only three Stars members left now Captain Wesker, Jill, and myself. We don't know where Barry is. Chris Redfield. Jill Valentine. Barry Burton. Rebecca Chambers. Albert Wesker. Resident Evil. Anyway, so depending on who we choose as our main protagonist in both Resident Evil 1, we would either play as Chris or play as Jill in search of him. Of course, this would be the introduction to some of the more funnier tropes from the classic games as well. That was too close. You were almost a Jill sandwich. <laughs> You're right! But without getting into too much detail, as we move on with the storyline in RE1, Chris would find out that Albert Wesker was actually a traitor, where he was in collaborations with the Umbrella Corporation and another mysterious entity. And this revelation for Chris is pretty much the icing on the cake, because throughout Resident Evil 1, his combat ability would be tested, especially when going up against some of the zombies and monsters of this title. Though Albert Wesker's betrayal would be a devastating blow to the Stars team, Chris and the others would still have to face one more Umbrella B.O.W. monster much more advanced compared to all the others he's faced in the Spencer Mansion estate, which this would be the foundation to his fight against bioterrorism. Because not only does he have to fight the multiple tyrants and BOWs for the rest of his life, he would also suffer more and more mentally due to this lifestyle. But moving back by the end of Resident Evil 1, Chris and the remaining Stars members would make their escape from the Arklay Mountains and return back to Raccoon City, where they would try to warn the public and the police chief about the Umbrella Corporation's involvement with the T-Virus and all the monsters they encountered during their mission. Though this would all be in vain, because Chris not knowing that the chief of police himself was also working alongside with Umbrella and was even involved with some of the murders that occurred in the city. Though Chris would have his suspicions with the chief of police, he would then carry out his own investigation in regards to Brian Irons and the Umbrella Corporation. With this direction having him go to the European branch of Umbrella, leaving behind some of his comrades at Raccoon City for the time being. Where in Resident Evil 2, Claire Redfield would realize that Chris has already departed by the time she made it to the city. Leon! It's good to see you're still among the living. It looks like we're not going to find your brother. <laughs> there are 
there's no reason for us to stay any longer than necessary. Let's split up, look for any survivors, and get out of here. Whereas in Resident Evil 3, Jill Valentine opted to stay at the city a little while longer to investigate further, but had the agreement that she would catch up with Chris eventually. Barry Byrne would also be notified of Chris's investigation in Europe, but would also follow after he secured his family safely due to the possibility of Umbrella retaliating against him. Die. Is, is it you? Are you ready to finish this? Which now brings us to the next storyline, where finally Chris and Jill meet up again and make their way to another Umbrella Corporation facility, where you would go face to face against another advanced form of a tyrant named Talos, a BOW equipped with armor and weapon, while also being controlled by the Umbrella AI system called the Red Queen. Code name Talos, a pinnacle of biological weapons. All controlled by the Red Queen computer. The ultimate weapon. Though due to plot armor, Chris and Jill make it out alive, not knowing at the time that Albert Wesker has been on their tail, which this interaction between the two former comrades would be explored upon in the next game, which would be Resident Evil Code Veronica. Because here, Chris Redfield would have a significant role in the second half of the game. which the initial premise has us use Claire Redfield, following her journey after RE2, where she would also go to Europe to investigate Chris's whereabouts inside of one of Umbrella Corporation's HQ. Though her journey would have her encounter the Ashford family, and would eventually have her at the Umbrella Antarctic base. Chris, on the other hand, would also follow Claire's trail after finding out that she's been captured, eventually making his way at the base as well. Also on a quick side note, Chris at this time is still designed in a star's uniform, and his overall build was roughly the same from his Resident Evil 1 rendition. Because remember earlier, we compared the two versions of him, and how starkly it contrasted with one another. Well, Resident Evil Code Veronica would be the foundation as to why his character build and design would be changed for the rest of the series. Because Chris in Resident Evil Code Veronica would also encounter Albert Wesker again. But this time around, Wesker would be able to show off his newfound powers due to the viral strain he received prior to being attacked by the tyrant in RE1, showing the great difference in both strength and speed between the two men, especially at the end of the game when they would go toe to toe, with Wesker utterly dominating Chris. But due to plot armor again, Chris was able to escape while Wesker does his maniacal laugh. Though on a more serious note, it was at this time that the developers realized that Chris had to make a drastic character design, especially if Chris had to go against more B.O.W.s and especially Wesker. Today's your lucky day. Next time we meet, don't count on another. Next time. Until we meet again. <laughs> Because this new design would follow the events that happened in Resident Evil 5, The Lost in Nightmares DLC, and Resident Evil Revelations, where his character build has drastically been changed, giving him more of a hulking stature, with the developers indicating this change due to his frequent encounters with Wesker, and the necessity for Chris to bulk up to even stand a chance against him. And at this point in the series, a lot of the RE fans have seen this version of Chris Redfield to be the most prominent and recognized rendition, because starting prior to RE5's release, the reveal trailer for this game already showcased his much more bulky form. Even in terms of gameplay, it was emphasized that he would showcase his brute strength. 
making him a character that would lean more to the action-heavy direction that the series has turned to. Because as we play as Chris in RE5, there were countless times where his brute strength would be in full display, which the first one would be his encounter with Albert Wesker, but the famous out of all would be this moment right here. Now many RE fans dubbing him Chris the Boulder Puncher Redfield, which compared back to his version in RE1, one can only scratch their heads as to why the drastic change in character design and game series genre. Anyways, like I mentioned earlier, his storyline would continue with RE5, The Lost in Nightmares DLC, and Resident Evil Revelations. With all three premises having him now as a BSAA operative, which was an organization created to combat bioterrorism around the globe, with him actually being one of the founders. And the storyline would actually play out in this sequence, with Resident Evil Revelations 1 playing out before the events of RE5, with Jill trying to find the whereabouts of Chris this time around. But through some diabolical and scheming events, the head of the BSAA, the FBC, which was a United States version of an anti-bioterrorism organization, and Veltro, the actual bioterroristic group, would be involved, leaving both Chris and Jill right in the middle of the events surrounding all three organizations, with some revelations being uncovered when they find out about the new T-Abyss virus, causing both Jill and Chris to fight a tyrant-like monster by the end of the game. Though these events for Chris would would be a separate and isolated event when it comes to his next adventure, which would span for a couple of years in the course of both Lost in Nightmares DLC and Resident Evil 5. Because with this journey, Chris again will be joined by Jill Valentine, as they finally figure out the whereabouts of the mysterious Oswald E. Spencer, one of the founders of the Evil Umbrella Corporation. Though their intel was correct about his location, it would come to a surprise when they see a familiar face again with Albert Wesker making his return, and better than ever. And a few years ago, we got a tip from a reliable source. The whereabouts of Umbrella's founder, Oswell E. Spencer. So we paid him a visit, hoping he'd lead us to Wesker. Wesker! Because remember his version of superhuman strength and speed in Resident Evil Code Veronica? Well at this segment, there was no doubt that Wesker was at his peak, showing Matrix-like superhuman powers, being able to dodge gunshots on a whim. Also during this time, Chris would still have his larger stature designed to help him combat Wesker to a certain degree, but even this bulky version of Chris still stood no chance against Wesker in a hand-to-hand -hand combat altercation, which by the end of the skirmish, Jill would be presumed dead, leaving Chris reeling for the loss of his longtime partner. So when we finally get to play as him in RE5, you can tell he was surely affected by the events of losing someone very close to him. With his adventure placing him in Africa, where he would explore the Kijuju region and discover the origins of the T-Virus. Also along the way, the subplot of looking for Jill would be a key factor, especially once again, Albert Wesker would make his return, but this time around, he would have Jill Valentine on his side. So playing out very similar to the Lost in Nightmares DLC events, Chris would still be overwhelmed with the superhuman-like nature of both Jill and Wesker. Though again, due to plot armor, Chris is able to once again live through this event and eventually have his final confrontation against his longtime nemesis. Time to die, Chris. With Resident Evil 5 showcasing the final battle between the two former Stars members, though now on top of his superhuman like strength, Wesker would also imbue himself with the Uroboro strain. Though through some unfortunate circumstances, Wesker would find himself at the mercy of Chris for the final time, which now brings us to his next adventure in Resident Evil 6. But unlike the Chris we controlled for the many previous games in this series, instead we have a Chris that's been suffering through PTSD due to the constant loss of comrades and the never-ending battle against the many B.O.W.s in the world. But throughout RE6, Chris would again regain his composure and power through his dilemma, with the events having him even battle the world-ending B.O.W. Heios at the final act of his campaign. And even with the loss of his most recent comrade Pierce, Chris by the end of the game has finally again conquered his demons and once again still be able to walk forward towards his next mission, which would be in Resident Evil 7.
but before we quickly go over this version of Chris Redfield, I am fully aware of the complete redesign from his versions from RE5 and 6, now sporting a slimmer and more realistic tone, with a face model completely different from what we've been used to these last several years of his iteration. He even caused a trend on the internet of saying hashtag not my Chris Redfield, which I don't blame them, due to the sudden change in design, and the lack of background as to why he's working with Blue Umbrella, the now reformed version of the very company that started this whole mess of bioweapons and altering Chris's life forever. But anyways, in RE7, Chris would make his appearance by the end of the game, allowing this story of the mold strain and the Baker family incident tie in within the Resident Evil universe. Also, we get a chance to play as Chris on the Not A Hero DLC, as he would fight against the mold strain himself and eventually Lucas Baker. Anyways, by the end of the story of RE7, this would be the moment where we would be acquainted with Ethan Winters, the main protagonist of this game, because this key story moment would play on in the later Resident Evil installments, which would be Resident Evil Village, or dubbing it Resident Evil 8 due to the Roman numeral annotation from the village title. But this time around, Chris Redfield would be shifted to a drastically different role, with his portrayal being that of a villain, eliminating Mia Winters in front of Ethan. Which from another video, I've speculated that his role would be similar to what we saw from Dante in DMC4, and how his opening sequence of being a villain would actually be a front, with the motives for his actions being justified at some point in this game. Also this time around, his character redesign would return back to a similar look from RE5 and 6, and his stature would somewhat be in the middle of that bulky design and the slimmer build in RE7. Also, I love the whole dark and assassin-like operative vibe that I get with his new look, and I do hope that this latest version of Chris Redfield gives us the darkest and most brooding iteration that we've seen today, being a complete turnaround from his initial version in RE1, where his battles with monsters and losing comrades throughout the years has finally made him snap. Anyways, which version of Chris Redfield was your favorite, and what plotline do you think would happen in Resident Evil Village? Please let me know your thoughts on the comment section down below. Also, if you guys enjoyed this many faces of Chris Redfield video, then please don't forget to like and subscribe for more content like this in the future. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching, and as always, you guys have a great rest of your day, and this is Hey Deva, and I'll see you guys on the next video.